Get this and get it straight. Crime is a sucker's road, and those who travel it wind up in the gutter of the prison of the grave. There was a gorgeous tapestry found under a tomb, and they were all after it. The worried importer, the man with half a face, the Englishman in an L.A. slum, and the lady wearing a green veil. But before it was over, none of them had it, and two of the four were dead. From the pen of Raymond Chandler, outstanding author of crime fiction, comes his most famous character in The Adventures of Philip Marlowe. Now, with Gerald Moore, starred as Philip Marlowe, we bring you tonight's transcribed story, The Baton Sinister. I'd watched the blood-red sun set behind an ugly purple storm out on the ocean, and the weird afterglow that crept into the canyons of the Hollywood Hills made me uneasy. Added emphasis to the disquieting phone call I received at my office from a man named Pollard Schindler, whom I knew was a very capable worldwide broker of bizarre art objects. In words that fell over each other in urgency, he asked me to meet him at my place at once. As I drove to my apartment, I figured the trouble lay ahead. But I didn't realize how close it was until I parked and started out of my car. A bullet smashed the corner of my windshield and I ducked for cover, then hugged the building and headed for the rear where I was sure I'd seen a gun flash. I was halfway there when the side door flew open and Pollard Schindler himself stopped me. Marlowe! He was white-faced and shaking, his eyes ringed by dark blue circles of fatigue. Marlowe! Marlowe! That shot! Yeah, somebody threw a slug at me, Schindler, from back there. I was afraid of this. We can't talk here. Not now. Come. Let's get in your car and drive. Hurry. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. What's all this about? Who shot at me and why? It... It must have been that lizard, Myron Loth. Oh? He's followed me all the way from England, Marlowe, because... But I... I tell you all about it when we're safe. Right now, we must get away from here. Okay, but watch yourself. Come on. Well, so far, so good. You see that hole in the windshield? It's lucky it's not in my head. Uh, are we being followed? Not yet, anyway. Well, Pollard, last time it was a cloak of Kamehameha and a trip to Honolulu. What is it this time? It's worse. A tapestry model, 15th century, and exquisite. Worth 20000 as a museum piece alone. Hey, that's a lot of money for a chunk of cloth. Bah, it's nothing. I'm getting better than 80000 for it from a man named Arthur Merritt in Seattle. 80 grand. Yes, correct. You see, this Merritt claims to be a direct descendant from Edward, second Duke of York, who fell at Agincourt. Really? Yeah. He spent a fortune tracing his genealogy and collecting family treasures, and regards this tapestry as his greatest prize. Mm. Oh, it's a gorgeous thing, Marlowe. Depicts the Duke on a gold horse, riding to battle beside the king. And such colors, reds, blues, greens, breathtaking. How bad? Ah, but I'm so tired. I don't think I've slept in weeks. For 80,000 bucks, you can afford to be tired, Schindler. But how does the guy with the itchy trigger finger fit into all this? Loft, that's come. He was after the tapestry, too. He got wind of the fact that someone was willing to pay 80,000 for it. But he doesn't know who. I see. You found it first, Yes. Huh? Yes, in a sealed tomb under the ruins of a castle in Wales, just minutes ahead of Loft. Where's the tapestry now? At this moment, it's in a cheap suitcase checked in a public locker at the Kavenga Boulevard bus depot. Mm -hmm. Now, I want you to pick it up and get it safely to Arthur Merritt. Here, here's the locker key. You take it on a plane leaving in three hours and your money. Five one hundred dollar bills. Enough? Enough. Where will I find out the merit? Uh, 76 West Street, Seattle. He'll be expecting you. And Marlowe, I feel better if you get the tapestry soon and keep it with you until plane time. You're really afraid of this guy, Loft, aren't you? He'll stop at nothing. I warn you. Now, I, uh, I'll get off here at the corner, Marlowe. All right. Incidentally, when you get the tapestry, don't go back to your apartment. Loft may be waiting there. Uh, I'm at the Hollywood Crest Hotel. Hollywood Crest, huh? Yeah, call me when the job is done. Goodbye, Marlowe, and good luck. You'll need it. The key Schindler left was numbered 410, so I drove to the bus station and went in. A casual walkthrough showed me that locker number 410 was the last on the left. Then I ambled over to the lunch counter, ordered a sandwich and coffee, and sat down to case the rest of the customers. Finally, I spotted him. A dark man in ragged clothes with a profile out of Western Asia who was also watching number 410. The profile glanced around nervously and looked away fast when he caught me watching him. 
I eased the key to Fort's hand out of my pocket and slipped it under my sandwich. Told the waitress I'd be right back and started toward him. He saw me coming and made for the back exit, broke into a run. When he got to the door, we played follow the leader down the tunnel to the alley behind the bus barn and around a corner. There the game stopped. Because a claw that belonged on a lobster reached out, grabbed me by the shirt front, and pulled me up against 18 inches of curved Damascus steel, sharp enough to shave with. I knew then why he'd shown me only his profile. Half his face was handsome, the other half. Well, when he spoke, he hissed through the flexible half of his mouth. Stand still, my friend, or I slit your gizzard for you. Where is Myron Loft? I don't know. I never met the man. Up close, that is. Liar, you are working for him. Keep using that knife of punctuation, pal, and I'll admit anything. I followed the fat German. I watched him put the tapestry in one of those lockers inside. Therefore, I knew that Loft or his hireling wouldn't be far behind. You mean me? You're off base. What's Myron Loft to you? (laughs) What indeed... Only I know the true value of that tapestry. For it was I who paid for it with half my face and half my mind. But before I'm through, Lot will know too. Where is he? I don't know, but I wish I were with him. Shall I kill you for being stupid? Go to Loft and tell him that Akar is not dead, but has come back to teach him the price of treachery. This will surprise him, no doubt, huh? He murdered me, so I would not talk. He left me for dead. Sent me hurtling, unconscious off a bridge in a truck of blazing oil. It made me like this. Claw for a hand, a face to frighten demons. But he did not kill me. Nice guy, Loft. And the tapestry itself. Tell him it will bring him nothing but despair. For I have put a curse of worthlessness on it that... A car! There, from the alley. The shot. Did you see who it was, Akar? No, but I didn't have to see it to know. He thinks he has finished it now. But he is wrong. Look. Look for the... Baton sinister. What, what? Look for what, Akka? In the Duke's shield, the baton sinister. Akka. The words baton sinister, whatever that meant on his twisted lips. The twisted little man died. I walked back carefully the way I'd come, but life in the bus depot was going on as usual. The waitress gave me a hard eye when I sat down at the lunch counter again, and the mirror over the back bar told me why. I was pasty green from eyes to mouth. The thought that death in an alley still did that to me was strangely gratifying. I got the key from under the sandwich, dropped a buck on the counter, and then went to lock a 410 and opened it. Schindler's tattered suitcase was there. I picked it up, took it over to a stall phone, and sat on it while I put in a call to Lieutenant Matthews at Homicide. Oh, say that again, Marlow. I don't think I heard you right. Yes, you did, Matthews. I said a man with half a face named Akar was shot in the alley back of Coinga Bus Depot. Probably because he knew too much about a tapestry. Yeah, yeah, that's what you said the first time. So who did it? You got any ideas? Well, it could be a guy named Myron Loft. That's all I know about him. Just a name. Okay, I'll send somebody. Stick around, will you, Phil? Hey, hey, Lieutenant. Yeah? You happen to know what a baton sinister is? Uh, spell that for me, will you, Phil? Never mind, Matthews. I'll call you again before I leave. When I left the bus depot, I drove to my office, took the suitcase upstairs, and after I locked myself in, I opened it under the lamp on my desk. Folds of dazzling cloth spilled out. I remembered Schindler saying the Duke was riding a gold horse, so I looked for that. Yeah, it was easy to spot. And from there, I located his shield. It was deep blue with three white roses on one side and a red lion on the other, and in the center... Pointing diagonally from upper right to lower left was a thin line of still deeper blue. That was all I had a chance to see. Because a hand in a rubber glove clamped a wet cloth over my face and the sickly, sweet odor went through me. Like warm oil through a paper bag. A hundred years later, I had a strange dream. I saw a pair of high-heeled green suede shoes, and then... And then a woman in a green veil looking at an empty suitcase. <clears throat> it must have been a dream. Because I couldn't move, and my eyelids were lead. And when the green veil and green shoes left, everything went black again. Next time, it was no dream. I was face down on my office carpet alone and very sick to my stomach. I'd been chloroformed. I crawled over to the desk and pulled myself up. The suitcase was open and empty. 
Somehow I got the phone off the hook, dialed information, and a minute later I had my client on the wire. Marlow, you sound sick. What is wrong? I am sick. You're going to be too, Schindler. Your tapestry's gone. It was stolen. Caught? Stolen? Yeah. Oh, no, no. It can't be. You blundering, stupid fool, Marlow. Why did you What did let... you say? I'm sorry, Phil. Screaming in hysteria won't get it back, will it? No. How did it happen? Well, I brought it up here to my office, but somebody was already in here laying for me. I was chloroformed and out for about half an hour. When I came to, it was gone. Now listen. You know a man named Akar, horribly scarred from Burns. Akar? No. Why? Did he get it? Yeah. Not the way you think. He was killed at the bus station. What? Killed? Good heavens. Did Loft do it? I don't know. Akar thought so, and I'm getting tired of hearing that name, Loft. Hey, incidentally, what's a baton sinister? Baton sinister? Yeah. A mark in heraldry, but... But why that one? Well, it might be important. What is it actually, Polly? Well, it's, uh, it's simply a short line on a shield or a scutcheon. Mm-hmm. It runs diagonally from sinister chief to dexter base. What does that mean? From upper right to lower left, maybe? If you're facing the shield, yes. It's the mark of fraudulence. But why? Well, I was told to look for the baton sinister by, uh... Hey, wait a minute, Polly. Huh? What? There's something on the floor here. It looks like an envelope. <clears throat> yeah. There's nothing in it, but it's addressed to... Holy smoke, this is addressed to Myron Loft, 946 South Grand Avenue, L.A. I knew it. I knew Loft was behind the Tef Marlow. But now we've got a chance to get the tapestry back. Where is this Grand Avenue? Yeah, it runs through a slum called Bunker Hill. Any cab driver knows it. I'm going down there now, Schindler. Good. I'll get there as soon as I can to cover you. And, and Marlow, listen. The man is a devil. Be careful. <laughs> Bunker Hill stuck up above downtown L.A. like a water on a debutant's hand. The big street that had tunneled under it or bypassed it years ago left it nothing more than a dingy, isolated attic where the city's worn-out cast-offs finally end up to die. And the big hotels that opened on the swank street below had all carefully turned their backs on the hill. I parked near Angel's Flight and walked on the odd number side of the street until I spotted 946, a crumbling yellow stucco rooming house that clung to the hill face from habit only. And I gave the windows a lot of attention to be sure no one was watching. And I went out of the corner, crossed and came back. An anemic nightlight was on at the end of the hall. So I pushed my way through the smells toward a door with a grimy card that said office. I was about to knock when a voice purred from the landing on the stairs behind me. When you turn round, do it slowly, understand? Uh, perfectly. I dare say you're Pollard Schindler's man. Could be. Which makes you Myron Loft, Yes, huh? I've been up on the roof watching you. I expected you'd come before long. I suppose you want the tapestry. Now, how'd you guess that? Then what price has Schindler decided to offer me? Price? You're kidding. Hardly. I don't enjoy humor. Perhaps you don't know much about the tapestry, hmm? Not much. I know more than I used to. I had quite a chat with Akar. Akar? <laughs> That's impossible. My ex-assistant is dead. I know. But he lived long enough to tell me about the baton sinister on the Duke's shield. That's a lie, my fine fellow. There's no baton sinister on that shield, and it's... Oh, of course. That sly idiot. Akka would try something like a baton sinister. But for what purpose, I can't imagine. Just to make sure that you'd pay for his murder. What's that? Must have been a shock to find out he'd survived that burning truck accident you tried. So you finished him tonight with a bullet. Oh, that's strange. How much more do you know along this line? Enough to make bargaining more than worth your while, and I haven't kept it all in my head. I see. Well, my door is a second on the left. Now, move along now, quickly. I see no reason to hurry. I do. See what you mean. Although the accent was Oxford, the gestures were strictly skid row. So as I proceeded, Myron Loft and gun into my lord's sagging chamber. I watched carefully for the chance I knew I'd have to take before long. But a small step toward a dark corner... No, no, don't try that. Told me it wasn't going to be easy. The gentleman with the flaccid voice was being very wary about me. Now turn about and face me, quickly. So wary about me, in fact, that the quiet footstep behind him went unnoticed. The footstep that had been made by a green suede pump that belonged to a lady with a veil also green. I now knew I'd actually seen earlier in my office. When she took her next step, the gun she clenched in her expensively gloved hand was raised high. It came down hard. <laughs> Girl of my dreams, I thank you. That was neat, and believe me, not a moment Never too mind soon. That. He's not dead, is he? No, he's just out cold. He's in deep freeze. But, uh, uh, aren't we being a little matter of fact about all this? We are. Did uh, you expect tears? Well, from the veil, yeah. 
But that's where I'm probably being misled. I should concentrate on your green suede shoes. They seem to be more in character. And you seem to be quite ungrateful. And Gabby. So why don't we just move on some? Over there, that bundle. It could be the tapestry. The tap... Hey, lady, you're not after it too, are you? No. I came here to save your life. Oh. I love you. That's charming. Come on, mister. Are we warm? Hot. Yeah, this is it, all right. Good. Now get back. Get... Away from it. Oh, no. Oh, yes. Way back. And for safekeeping into that snug little closet there. Without so much as a peek? At the veil, I mean. Without so much as another word. Your mouth, I mean. Go on. Inside. It won't hold you for long, but I don't need long anymore. She was so right. Didn't hold me for long. Because even a misplaced hiccup could jar loose most any given segment of Bunker Hill construction. However, by the time I got to the street, it was Lady with Bale and Bundle tucked underneath her arm, climbing into a cab. And only a tail light skidding out of sight around a corner. So I played the only bet left. She departed in a cab. Maybe she'd arrived in one. And maybe that one was still in line at the hack stand across the street at the back of the hotel. At number four, I connected. Yeah, yeah, sure. The doll with a veil. I brought her here. Why? What's it mean to you? Everything. She's my long-lost sister. Where'd you pick her up? You can't remember. Okay, okay. Here, here's five. Now try it. Sure. It was a Sunset Gardens Hotel, Villa 12, which is around on the side. But you know what else? No, what else? I'll bet this five, she ain't really your sister at all. I'll bet she's really your wife. Oh, you're so wrong. She's really typhoid Mary, Jack. You better fumigate fast, both inside and out. Huh? Goodbye. <laughs> It was 30 anxious minutes weaving my way through the thick westbound traffic that any snail could have easily outsprinted before I was finally parked away from Villa 12. Then out of my car and running toward the squat chunk of termite-proof old Spain. But I hoped that again meet up with both the lady who wore a mosquito net for a hat and my client's hard come by drapery. But the bungalow in front of me said no such luck. Because it was dark, closed tight, and as quiet as snow falling all the way around. Until I was in the back. Where each villa had its own junior picnic grounds complete with barbecue pit. Then from somewhere behind me, I heard it. First the rattle of paper. Then a few footsteps, high heels, that I knew could be the green suede ones on flagstone. After that, over near the pit, liquid poured on wood, and then sudden flame. It was the lady whose shoes I knew, all right, but this time no veil. Only a face that might have been pretty if it weren't for the prancing shadows the flames threw over an expression that was a little more than determination, a little less than psycho. I moved close to her quietly. And when she had the tapestry unwrapped and was ready to make a little offering to the fire guards, I took my cue. Marshmallows what? would taste better, baby, yeah. honest. You. Yeah, a little me in 38, not so little. So stand very still, honey, priceless heirloom included. Oh, no, I won't. It's going to fire where it belongs. That's a matter of opinion. No, no, let go my arm, you big hate. Drop it. Let it go, baby. Better we dirty it than uh, singe it. Come on, let go. There, that's better. Now, come on, firebug. Who are you? Who? Oh, Naomi Marshall. Is that it out? Okay. Now tell me where you fit in the tapestry, or do we shake some more? No, no, thanks. I'll, I'll tell you what you want to know. Who are you? Name's Philip Marlowe. Cop? No, a private detective hired to babysit with the tapestry. Let's not change the subject. Okay, okay. Getting there. I'm Arthur Merritt's niece, and sole heir. A guy in Seattle who's waiting for me to deliver this item is your uncle? Uh-huh, my uncle's a jerk. Now wait a minute, wait a minute. Let me get this straight. You steal the tapestry, risk your life, play with guns, and with people who only play for keeps. All so you can get a chance to burn 80,000 bucks worth of fancy needlework. Listen, my uncle has been throwing away his money on antiques, and all he's got left of a half a million is a hundred grand. I don't want four-fifths of that used for this stinking substitute for wallpaper. Anything else? Yeah. How long have you been working on this project, this Operation Arson? A week. Came down from Seattle when I learned that the man my uncle was dealing with was named Pollard Schindler. You can fill it in from there. How do you mind if I leave? I'm looking forward to bed and a good cry. $80,000 worth. Do I go? Yeah, on one condition. Your gun, baby. It stays. I watched her until she was around at the front of the bungalow and out of sight. And I grabbed up the tapestry, started to fold it when... A sudden flare from the fire threw a crazy spurt of light over the material on my arm. And I saw that on the shield that the Duke of Kent carried, there was no baton sinister. This was not the same tapestry I'd examined in my office. And right then, just to make things all the merrier, 
have once again heard from Naomi Martin. <laughs> On the even chance that this was a trap, Naomi playing possum with healthy lungs, I ditched the tapestry in a nearby clump of trees, then gun in hand ran for the front door of Villa 12. I got there just as a gray convertible lights out roared off and Naomi was climbing back onto her feet. What took you so long? Now, listen, you, the real tapestry, where is it? The real... Oh, no, you're kidding. Baby, that number you just tried to burn is not the one I started out with tonight. It's minus Baton Sinister. Uh, minus who? What are you talking about? Just this. Maybe you still have the tapestry and the routine with the flames was done with a phony and strictly for my benefit. And maybe you're nuts. Now you listen. What I told you before was the truth, nothing but... However, if it happens to work out that I walked off with a phony and you did likewise, I'm sorry. I'll bet. For the time being, I'll buy it that way. Now, tell me what went on here. I was about to unlock the door when it happened. A hand with a rubber glove grabbed wait me. Wait a minute, and... wait a minute. Rubber glove? Rubber glove. Do we say everything twice? Mm. Whoever it was obviously didn't want to leave fingerprints. Oh, the smell of chloroform on his hands. Hey, come to think of it, I, I did get a whiff of something funny. How do you know about that? In my office when the tapestry was... Wait a minute, you were there. Didn't you get a look at him? No, there was, there was only a single light on, and you were already out cold when I got there. Yeah, but you must have seen something. Sure, stars. After he took the tapestry, then laid an envelope of some kind next to you, I, I told him to reach way up. Got me piled into a heap on your office floor. The envelope he ran. next to me. I, I followed, but I lost it. Hey, hey, hold it. And, and Back I... up, Naomi. What? Did you say he placed that envelope there next to me? That's what I said. See what I mean? We were... We Cut it out, baby. Him. I've got an idea, a thought. About a baton sinister and what's really going on. Also, it just occurred to me that Myron Loft might not remain unconscious forever. And that my client was going to cover me at Loft's place on Bunker Hill. Wait, wait where are you going, Marlowe? Once I pick up the tapestry I just hid, which may not be a phony, back to Bunker Hill. So long, kid. <laughs> Oh, no. Somebody! Somebody call the police! Marlo! Call Marlo! Marlo, thank goodness you're here. I... I just shot Myron Love. You did what, Schindler? Yes. Caught in him. Dead Marlo. Hey, hmm. for the love of Pete, what's going on in this joint? Nothing you can help, sweetheart. It was terrible, Marlowe. I came to this place after I didn't hear from you and found out which room Loft had. When I went in, he was on the floor, unconscious. So I started to look around for the tapestry. In the meantime, Loft came to, got hold of the gun and rushed you, is that it? Yes. We struggled, and then the gun went off. Oh, Marlowe, what should we do now? Call the police? Yeah, I'll take care of it. You go back into the room there and don't touch anything and see that nobody else does. All right, Marlowe. But uh, you have the tapestry? Yeah, I got it, Schindler. Safe and sound. Your worries are over. Homicide, Detective Lieutenant Matthews speaking. Hello, Matthews. Oh. I'm at 946 South Grand Avenue, and so's another body. What? At Myron Loft, I mentioned. My client, Paula Schindler, just shot him in self-defense. Which also clears up the death of Akar out behind the bus depot, huh? I mean, Loft got him and then tried for your client, but missed. Yeah. Yeah, if you believe my client. Yeah, well, I... Be... Oh, Marla, what are you reaching for? A few very tasty but hard to swallow facts. One, my client's a liar. Two, my client killed both Akar and Myron Loft. And three, I've been set up and used as neat as chump, patsy, sucker, fall guy. They all fit. He even shot through my windshield for realism. Paul Schindler never had the real tapestry, Matthews. He had only a phony. He gave it to me to deliver and then swiped it from me. After which, he put me on the trail of the real one. Uh-huh. So while swiping it back for him, like the good private detective you are, you'd come up with the real one, huh? That's tidy. I'll be right down, Phil. Okay. You you told the police what happened, Marlowe? Yeah. I told them, Mr. Schindler. I told them everything. Now there's nothing for us to do but wait. <laughs> does it, Lieutenant? Seven full pages of con confession from Mr. Pollard Schindler, a very crafty bird. Yeah, yeah, thanks, Mooney. Oh, uh, bring that girl in a couple of minutes, will you? All right. Well, Phil? 
Here it is, the whole story. Yeah? Yeah, look, followed Schindler, went after the tapestry in England, but Myron Loft got there first. However, Schindler was the one who knew where he could sell it way above museum price, so Loft had a duplicate made up and saw to it that Schindler stole it from him. And it was Akar who added the baton sinister, the mark of fraudulence in heraldry, to the fake tapestry. Uh, yeah, yeah. But I still don't clearly follow the rest of it, Phil. I mean, here in L.A., huh? Oh, well, it wasn't much of a change. Another verse, same song. Loft stayed close to Schindler all the way back from England. Yeah. And he watched and he waited until he figured that Schindler was ready to close his deal, you see. Yeah. Then he stepped forward and announced that the tapestry Schindler had was a phony. Oh. And that he'd given the real one for a healthy cut of the sale price. Uh-huh. And Loft couldn't go to Merritt direct because he didn't know who Merritt was. Sure. Oh. And from there it was me, the patsy, with the best of references. Oh. Can that do it for you? Yeah, just about. Schindler killed that car whom he didn't expect in the scene, and Loft, who he did, so neither one could spill to you. That's right. Now, it... uh, yeah, come in, come in. Now, when did you... Hey, oh, just a minute, Miss March, and please. Uh, when did all this come across to you, Phil? When I got mixed up with the lovely lady here. She told me that the man who had chloroformed me in my office had carefully placed an envelope on the floor next to me. An envelope I later took as a clue. From that switch, I started to look around for others. Oh, great. Hooray for Campfire Girl Me. What kind of a medal do I get? Yeah, you get a pretty nice one, Miss March, and thanks to Marlowe, you get freedom. You know, we could prefer charges against you. Like what? Like what? Like assault and battery for slugging Loft. Grand larceny for the theft of the tapestry from Loft's place. Attempted destruction of okay, private okay, property. Okay, okay, okay. I, I forgot about those things. Yeah. Thanks, Marlowe. Thanks, Marlowe. Is that your official statement? No more? Not even I'm sorry before you go? Well, yes. I'm sorry, all right. Real sorry that I missed. Goodbye. <laughs> Another hour and my signature was on another dozen official papers before I was free to leave Matthews, who kept the real tapestry but gave me the one we got back from Pollard Schindler, the one with a baton sinister on it as a souvenir. So by the time I got back to my apartment, it was pushing four o'clock in the morning, and I was tired. Tired of a night that had been jammed full of crooked people who had taken crooked paths half across the world, chasing a buck. So tired, in fact, that I didn't notice Naomi Marchant leaning across the door opposite mine until she spoke. Marlo, Marlo, we could take that tapestry you have there, even if it's a phony one, and fly to Seattle and sell it to Uncle Arthur before he knows anything about what happened here. Marlo, we, we could... Marlo? No. Marlo? Marlo? Go away now. There was only one Marlo. thing to do. Put both Marlo. hands firm on her Marlo. shoulders, spin the girl around, Marlo. and across my knees... Don't you thank me! Oh, well. I was too tired for even that. The Adventures of Philip Marlowe, bringing you Raymond Chandler's most famous character and crime's most deadly enemy, star Gerald Moore and are produced and transcribed by Norman MacDonald. Script is by Mel Donnelly, Robert Mitchell, and Gene Levitt. The special music is composed and conducted by Richard Orant. Be sure and be with us next week when Philip Marlowe says... Rain slashing a glass roof, an old man's curiosity, and an imaginary imp out of place. They all became important when two people died violently, so a third could make a killing. Masterson speaking. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System.